Uh, I believe you were attracted to the blues at quite, quite a young age. Yes, I started to develop a, a, a taste, more my own taste for uh, blues, I guess, you know, in my early teens. I, you know, was a fan of the radio and uh, was attracted to artists like uh, Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and... Uh, as I got more into it, I sort of found their sources of Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf and Little Walter and and the Chicago blues scene. And in getting deeper into it, found that their source was the country blues from, you know, the 1930s and became a huge fan of uh, Robert Johnson and Blind Willie McTell and Blind Boy Fuller and the artists that actually created the genre. One would assume you, you were a pretty keen student of music growing up. Did you really go out of your way to, to uh, seek as many of these uh, performers as you could? Well, uh, I did. As, as I got into it, um, I became more uh, of a fan and more of a fan of the tradition of the blues. Um, I saw it as as a continuum as opposed to you know the pop stuff that would come and go it seemed the blues was was the foundation upon which uh, uh, most american music sprang, sprang from uh, for instance you know jazz and r&b and rock and roll all seemed to have a direct link to blues so i was hooked <laughs> Did you take uh, formal guitar lessons or anything like that? I did not. I, in fact, did not play a guitar until I was uh, 18. And I started playing professionally when I was 19. So oh, right. <laughs> it kind of came on me all of a sudden. I wasn't really trained in m music at all. Uh, I was an arts student, basically. I was uh, into painting and s sculpture in my teens. And... Uh, Blues was my my uh, hidden passion, I guess, and uh, it all came about uh, w when I got a guitar. It all just sort of transformed me. What? So really, it was rather a, a quick transition from when you started playing to when you started doing it professionally. But do you think? Y yes. How prepared do you think you were looking back on that time now? Um, I guess as prepared as one can be, you know, because. No one can be prepared for <laughs> the music business or a career uh, of, you know, traveling and, you know, being out of a suitcase and in one hotel to the next. Uh, that's that, that's a thing you can't really prepare yourself for. You have to either uh, be uh, into it or not, I guess. Mm. Now, in, in the early days, you also spent some time on the, the Los Angeles folk scene, um, which we didn't hear as much about as compared to what was happening in New York. How did the two scenes compare? Well, in Los Angeles, where I began my career, um, because New York was um, maybe too familiar or had old connotations to me, uh, I mean terror <laughs> for one of <laughs> of you know the the scene was so intense in new york um uh i began playing uh professionally in 62 and uh i went to california i had not ever been there before and um uh, decided it was fertile ground for me to check out my <laughs> my talents mm -hmm. and there was a wonderful scene in Los Angeles. There was a club called the Ash Grove that uh, gave rise to many, many um, artists like Taj Mahal, like um, Linda Ronstadt. Uh, it was it was a it was a, a roots club. It, it had artists like Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters and. Lightning Hopkins, as well as Doc Watson and Bill Monroe, and so it was like folk music, blues, bluegrass, um, and 
poetry reading. It was like you know a very hip scene, and um, so I kind of fit in there, and uh, within a, a short period of time, three or four months, I had established myself in Los Angeles and was playing jobs um, all over the uh, the L.A. area. Uh, I did a TV show <laughs> and made some uh, enough money to buy a car and drove uh, all up and down the state and then decided to go back east and try my luck in New York. Now you're right in, you're right amongst the, the folk and blues revival in, in the early to mid 60s. Looking back yeah. now, do you have a theory on why, why that upsurge in interest in blues and folk happened at that particular time? Well, it, it it seems like it had been suppressed for a long time, and and it just by nature had to uh, come out. <laughs> it was uh, uh, an era where a, a, a lot of barriers were broken down, uh, especially racial bar barriers in the U.S. Anyway, um, there were uh, major student movements and. Uh, political movements afoot, you know, from my generation to change things. And folk music and blues always seems to lead the way. A lot of um, grand old blues players had their careers revived at that time as well. Exactly. Yeah, were you able to witness firsthand how, how some of them handled and coped with the, uh, the sudden notoriety? Oh, absolutely. I was on shows with everyone from Sunhouse to John Hurt to Lightning Hopkins to Bucka White um, many many others were rediscovered and were on the coffee house circuit you know yeah. and I got to be opening show for a lot of them and and got to know them well and learned an awful lot must have been so difficult also for not to be overawed by, by being in the presence of these, these artists too at that time. Oh, it was awesome, honestly. It yeah. was an amazing time. You were with uh, Vanguard Records during a golden era on that label. That must That's have been right. an exciting time. It was. It was truly dynamic. I got to meet uh, m many of the artists who recorded for Vanguard. I got to... Um, you know, record. Uh, I, I played some harmonica with with uh, Richard and Mimi Farinia. I got um, I played harmonica on a Rambling Jack Elliott album, uh, and of of course I had my own rec recording, which uh, went extremely well. My 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 first uh, recordings got um, a bit of notoriety, and it got me a lot of work. And I'm I'm very happy for those days, and that was a good way to, to to hit the scene. Of course, you're credited as being the one that brought the guys from the band over from Canada as well. Well, <laughs> I, I was friends of theirs from Toronto, and uh, when they came to New York, they would hang out with me, and we had a chance to go in and record, and and it brought together a lot of very dynamic players uh michael bloomfield and charlie M charlie musclewhite uh as well as uh, um you know robbie levon garth uh rick and um uh, and richard manuel the, the, these were superb players uh guys who had been professional since the 50s you know and were you know very talented guys they're just some marvelous sessions you recorded with them could you tell right from the start that they they had what it took to, to branch out on their own well in my um observation uh, i i thought they were the best <laughs> <laughs> and i was not surprised by a any of the uh the, the success that that followed them it was uh a dynamic time as well this was you know, before the industry, before the recording industry had gotten overblown and and hyped out. So it was, you know, if you were good, you could actually get, you know, <laughs> uh, recognition. Yeah. Of course, you were also in a, a position to witness firsthand the, the blossoming talent of a young Jimi Hendrix. 
yes i was in the right place at the right time i guess and uh and he was uh, stranded in New York, and I got us a gig with uh, him as my lead guitar player, and that was where he was dis- discovered and and was brought to e- England and became a huge superstar. Now, over the years that uh, you've been a, a regular visitor down here, and I've seen you on, on pretty much all those occasions, is there one thing I've noticed and always been impressed by a strong measure of intensity in, in your live performance? Is that something you you really go out of your way to strive for? Well, I I, I guess it happens. I, <laughs> I I don't. I'm not aware of it. I just you know this is the way I play, and and I love to play in Australia. I love the country and the people. I've met some lifelong friends there, and um, I feel quite at home. <laughs> Such a, a long catalogue of work to draw from. Do you have trouble at times deciding on what to include in a live set, or do you go on with a set list? Well, I, I, I don't go on with a set list, but I know hundreds of songs, and I just go by how I feel. Being a, a musician who, who seems to, to thrive on the live performance situation and touring, how do you how do you cope with a studio situation? Is that, is that an enjoyable environment for you? It, it can be. Uh, I have, you know, been very fortunate to have... Uh, recorded often so I, I'm not uh, intimidated by a studio and uh, I've, I've had a chance to um, you know work with some extremely talented artists over the years and uh, and engineers and producers who have uh, you know known what to do and have actually uh, um, you know hel- helped me out treme- uh, tremendously in the last uh, 20 years or so, I've I've had some some w- wonderful experiences in the studio. Uh, oddly enough, the last time I was in the st- st- studio was with Tom Waits um, back in March, and he produced uh, an al- album for me that will be released next year. Wow. That I am extremely excited about. And before that, I had, you know, um, worked with J.J. Kale and Duke Robillard and Little Charlie and the Nightcats. And I've had a, a, a chance to work with the even more, you know, talented players. It just, it's, it's a fantastic scene out there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, speaking of Little Charlie, he'll be here, I think, just a couple of weeks before yourself. Do you aware of that? Oh, was that right? Oh, yeah. That's, they are one of my favorite bands ever. They're playing uh, the same venue here in Melbourne as you are. Uh, but oh, the Continental. The Continental, yes. Yeah, so maybe your paths will cross. Oh, I hope so. You maintain an enormous touring schedule. You never get tired of the road? No, I, this is my life and I love it. What's the secret to, to still enjoying that, that life on the road after so many years? I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is what I've grown to become. You know, I mean, this is what I've... Uh, you know, strive for and to, and to have things go so well, or um, is just you know I, I feel extremely fortunate. How did your uh, your current deal with with Point Black Records come about? Um, I, I had been asked by John Lee Hooker to accompany him on his first recording for Point Blank. He wanted to do some acoustic things like in his old days, you know, mm-hmm. and he asked if I would. Uh, Accompany him on three songs. This is for his uh, album, Mr. Lucky. Yes. And um, on the the strength of that, I guess uh, there was an an interest in me from Point Blank, which at that time was located in England. Um, And then I was on tour later that year with. J.J. Kale, um, who is, you know, one of these cult figures, one of the, the, the great songwriters and players. And on this tour, he said, you know, John, I'd love to produce an album on you. And he says, you, you've been overlooked for so long, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, <laughs> I'm ready if you're ready. So we, we spoke to... Uh, uh, point blank to see if there was any interest in recording me and 
they jumped at it. Oh, J.J. Cale producing John Hammond. Wow, what a deal. <laughs> so that began um, my current uh, situation with, with Point Blank. Uh, the four albums that I made for them were all nominated for gra Grammys. And, um, and this new album I'm so happy with. I, I, I don't even know how to begin to tell, tell you, but it's going to be uh, um, a slight departure for me. I, I, on this album of 13 songs, there are 12 Tom Waits songs. Wow. And uh, Tom played on them w w along with me, and uh, Larry Taylor on bass. Stephen Hodges on drums, Augie Myers on key, key, keyboards, and Charlie Musselwhite on harmonica. It was a very dynamic time. Sounds fantastic. Is it in a blues vein? Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, wow, can't wait for that. Yeah, yeah me, me either. <laughs> it's been it's been mastered since July, and it's been very painful having to wait all these months. <laughs> <laughs> What's but, the, the plan, I'm sorry. The plan releases in the new year, is it? Yes. Ah, oh, tremendous. That's really something to look forward to. I'm very excited. It's obviously a happy partnership between you and Point Black because since you've been there, you've, you've put out some of the best work of your career without a doubt. I, I, I think so too. And uh, John Wooler, the head of Point Blank, has stuck you know, by his guns and uh, has done everything he said he would do. And I... I take my hat off to him as uh, a guy who has, you know, believed in me. Away from uh, recording and performing, one wonderful project you were involved with a few years back was the uh, the Robert Johnson documentary. Yes, that, that was very, very dynamic, and um, I was uh, v very happy with the uh, the results. Um, it, it was it was produced by Channel Four in London. Um, with a, a, a fantastic crew who had done all their homework. The, the uh, producer and director were uh, blues fans, but they also were documentarians, and they knew how to, to put it together so it would, it would flow, you know. Uh, I had never done anything like that before and was uh, a little bit intimidated. There was no script. <laughs> <laughs> and we went down through... Uh, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Arkansas, Texas, Tennessee, and got to, you know, firsthand look at all the places where Robert Johnson had traveled and uh, had lived, where he'd gotten married, where he'd gone to school, and, and you know, they, they had really done their research well and found these you know, friends of Robert Johnson from the old days who are still happening, you know. And I got to talk to them, and, and I, I, I thought the film was, was good. It was obviously a, a real labor of love for you to be yes, involved it with was. it. Yeah. Blues music is a music form that seems to, to thrive continuously, regardless of other musical trends that, that come and go. What do you think it is about blues that does that? I think it's the tradition. You know, the fact that it is steeped in history, there are so many artists who have been part of this, you know, that have, have you know, devoted their lives to uh, the performance of this kind of music that um, hasn't been altered very much uh, over the years because of this sense of tradition and, uh, you know, uh, time span. It's just uh, a... Uh, a deep rooted uh, art form now talking about your tour down here uh, as well as the the club shows that you're doing I believe you're also going to be playing at a, a festival over in uh, Western Australia the, the Bridgetown That's correct, yeah yes. how do the two situations compare to you a, a live club show or, or a festival crowd do you vary your, your act accordingly um I play everything by ear. <laughs> I, I, I go, go in and size it up and, and do what I know how to do. Yeah, get a feel for the audience. And, yeah. yeah. Will you be road testing any of that uh, new Tom Waits material during shows? Not yet. I, I, 
what I hope will happen is that in March we'll put this band together and do a worldwide tour. Okay. And and these guys are all excited about it and 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 they're anxious to tour with me. So I feel like it's going to be a a, a dynamic new year. <laughs> Start, start the millennium off on a, 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 a new foot. Now, you're in Melbourne in November. What, what's on your books between now and then? Uh, I have a tour of Europe beginning at the end of this month for a month. And uh, I'll be home for about five days, and then I'll be heading down to, to your part of the world. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm yeah. very excited. Oh, certainly looking forward to it. I've got some fantastic memories of your previous tours here. So, uh, we can't wait. And the Continental is a, is a great room. It, uh, it is. It yeah. absolutely is. So you'll really go down a treat there. Well, thanks a lot for your time, John. Well, you're so welcome. I do appreciate it. Thanks for all those years of wonderful music. And, uh, oh, well, I hope there are many more to come. Oh, so do I. And I'll be there front and center down at the Continental to see you. I look forward to it. Okay, you take care. Thank you so much. All, all the best. Bye-bye.